It's a great joy to be here. The last time that I preached at Grace Baptist Church, it was over in Richmond Hill in the basement and how you have grown since then, how you have grown in number and how your reputation has grown, how you have grown in faith. Uh, I am very encouraged this morning by your worship, uh, not only the quality of the songs that were played, but the enthusiasm with which you sang those songs this morning. So it is a high honor and a great blessing for me to be here with you this morning and to preach the gospel to you. And I bring you greetings from North Shore Baptist Church. Uh, we were already there in the worship service uh, this morning and your pastor was there and uh, we did not uh, have an opportunity to stay and to hear him preach, but he's preaching twice there this morning. And, uh, and so we're, this is the, uh, the Great American Pulpit Swap. And so I am here and uh, Peter is there. And as it says in 1 Peter 3.18, uh, the righteous for the unrighteous. And in this case, I am the unrighteous. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, dear Father in heaven, for the opportunity that we have this morning to worship you in the hearing of the word. And as we do today, Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would give me great compassion for the people. I pray, dear Lord, that there would be no pretense in anything that I'm saying. I pray, dear Lord, that I would be very, very joyful in my explanation of the scriptures this morning. And I pray, Lord, that I would have great compassion for the people and for their prayer lives. Lord, I pray that you would cause us this morning uh, in grace, uh, through the grace of God, to see how it is that you would have us to pray. And then, Lord, I pray that we would leave not having heard a sermon, Lord, but I pray that we would leave uh, ready to change and ready to be different. And so we wish to be different. We don't want to be the people that we were when we walked in the doors today. <clears throat> we want to be different. And so change us, Lord, by your gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just to set up the text, and I'll ask that you please turn to Exodus chapter 32, just to set up the text. The book of Exodus is a story about God delivering his people. God made a promise back in Genesis to a man by the name of Abraham as that promise was made to him. One of the promises was that he would have a seed and that seed would multiply. And so through uh, very providential circumstances, we see that his descendants moved to the land of Egypt. They were about 70 in number and they grew to be about 2 million in number over about 430 years. Now they're in Egypt and they need a deliverance and they receive a deliverance from God through the Lord, raising up a man by the name of Moses, who leads the children of Israel through a strong and mighty arm out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, into the wilderness. And now our text this morning finds us with the children of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. And Moses has received the law. He has received the Ten Commandments, uh, that is, the standard that God had for his nation, the children of Israel, written with his finger on tablets of stone, two tablets of stone, front and back. And Moses has also received instructions for how God is going to uh, desire to be worshipped by his people, and that is through the tabernacle. And all of those instructions have been given. As Moses is about to depart from Mount Sinai, having been up there for 40 days and 40 nights, he gets an awful report from the Lord. And the report is that the people at the base of the mountain have entered into idolatry. Um, they have gone before Aaron, who was temporarily put in charge, along with a man by the name of Hur, and they went to Aaron and they said, make gods for us who shall go before us. Aaron actually goes ahead and does it. He makes a god for them in the form of a golden calf. He tries to sanitize it by saying it is a feast that shall be made to the Lord. But these people, in just an absolutely delusional way, losing touch with all reality, commit the sin of idolatry, and it led to a moral decline. They started off worshiping the golden calf, and before you know it, they were drunk and they were naked. And there was a drunken orgy going on at the base of Mount Sinai. 
<clears throat> as Moses receives this word from the Lord. Now, what is the word he receives from the Lord? Exodus 32, verses 7 and 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Notice how God is being almost sarcastic here. He's no longer calling them his people, but he is referring to them as your people. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, as a result of this, the Lord tells Moses what he is going to do. Here is the punishment that the Lord says will follow. Verses 9 and 10. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. you. Get the picture here. Moses has just received literally the hard copies of the Ten Commandments engraved in stone. He now receives this word from the Lord. He has not yet witnessed with his own eyes the idolatry. He has just been told about it, and he has been told that he is going to have to be alone again. You remember earlier in the book of Mo in Exodus, there was a story where Moses was left alone. It was after he had committed a murder. And after he committed this murder, he fled by himself to the land of Midian. And now he's going down with the understanding that he is never going to see these people again. He will be alone again. He is never going to see them again. <clears throat> And so what does he do? He begins to pray. That is when we pray. We pray when we realize that things are not going well. What prompts prayer for the most part is when we look into the future and we say that unless something changes, the future is not going to be desirable. A few weeks ago, my son Charlie called me and he said that his wife Molly, who was pregnant, had been to the doctor and there is some sort of a complication with her pregnancy. Now, don't ask me what it is. Not that I don't want to tell you. I'm just not a gynecologist. I just don't know how to explain what's going on there. But the baby is okay, but there is some sort of a complication with the pregnancy. And immediately after Charlie told me that, I said to him, now we really need to trust the Lord. And Charlie said, you're right. We do need to trust the Lord, but nothing has changed. We have always needed to trust the Lord. It is only when we are made aware of our weakness or our problem that we really begin to realize that we begin to trust the Lord. And what do we do when we realize that we need to trust the Lord? We pray. And so Moses prays. When we pray, what we are asking God for is help. God, help. If you don't help, then things will not be good. And so we can look at the prayer of Moses and we can learn a lot. So in this context, listen to the prayer of Moses, verses 11 through 13. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, that's the word there, Jehovah or Yahweh, the covenant name of God. Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he, speaking of the Lord God, bring them out to kill them in the mountain and to consume them in the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. That is the end of his prayer. And now here is the result of his prayer, verse 14. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his 
people. Let me read it again. Look at it. Meditate on it. Think about it. And the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. As I look at the result of this prayer, it raises a question about the sovereignty of God and the immutability of God. Now, what is the sovereignty of God? Well, I'll just put it in very simple terms. It means that God is in control of all things. What is the immutability of God? Well, it's just a fancy word that the theologians have come up with. It's not uh, actually a biblical word, but it's a good word. It just means that God does not change. And so as we look at this verse, verse 14, we ask the question, does God change his mind? Now, those from a Reformed perspective say no. And I myself am of the Reformed persuasion. I am a firm believer in the absolute sovereignty of God in all things. I am a firm believer in the immutability of God. I am an outspoken Calvinist who believes firmly that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. And so I go to my Reformed leaders for answers to the question, does God change his mind? And immediately their answer is no. And I asked the question, what about Exodus 32, 14? And they attempt to explain the passage in light of the already presupposed notion that God does not change his mind. And what they will say to me is, this is an example of anthropomorphic language. And I say, what is anthropomorphic language? And they will say, well, it's just God's way of explaining things to us in a way that we can understand them. You see, we really can't understand the mind of God, so he uses human language that we can relate to. It's really too complex for us to understand, so just God says it in a way that we can relate to it. To which I say, that answer does not satisfy me because the text clearly says that God relented from the evil that he said that he would do to his people. Others will say, well, you see what's going on here is that Moses is the one who changed and God's intention was to change Moses and he's the one who really changes and not God. And I say that a simple reading of the text has God ready to wipe them out and then the text says that God relents. And I honestly cannot look at it and say that Moses is the one who changed. The text very plainly says the Lord relented. It has to mean something. And some will argue and say, well, you're right. It does have to mean something. But whatever it means, it can't mean what it says. And the reason that it can't mean what it says is because Malachi 3.6 says, for I, the Lord, do not change. And because Numbers 23.19 says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said and will he not do it. And the New Testament says in James 1.17 that God is immutable, that there is no variation nor shadow due to change. To which I would say to all of those three verses, amen, amen, and amen, but that still does not exegete Exodus 32.14, where it clearly says that God relented from the evil that he said that he would do. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the immutability of God. I believe that when we sing, great is thy faithfulness, that we, with great confidence, can sing, as thou hast been, thou forever shalt be. But just quoting verses on immutability does not answer my question. And so here's my answer. And my answer makes me very unpopular with my Reformed brothers, and that is this. I believe that the verse says what it means and means what it says. I believe that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Another way of putting it is, I believe that whatever will be, will be. Uh, you can't really have the alternative. That is, that whatever will be will not be. So I believe that whatever will be will believe. I, be, I, I believe in the immutability of God. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that whatever will be will be. But I also believe that God uses means to accomplish his ends. And I believe that the chief means that God uses to accomplish his ends is prayer. 
So put it all together and what do you have? I believe that God ordained or decreed that Moses would pray. And I believe that Moses was used in that prayer to move the heart and to move the hand of God. Not to change his character. Not to change him in any way. But to move his hand. Now why do, why do I belabor this point? I do so because if we really do not believe that prayer can actually move the hand of God, what is the point? If we don't believe that things will change as a result of prayer, why do we pray? When I was a young boy growing up, every person in my church had a wall plaque or a refrigerator. Well, you know what? We didn't have refrigerator magnets. Then. When I was a boy, the magnet had not yet been invented. But there were wall plaques, and there would be the praying hands, and there would be a little phrase under it that says, prayer changes things. And then I became a Calvinist. And I thought, how silly. Prayer changes things. But now, as I become a Bible reader, you know what I believe? Prayer changes things. Now, no matter what you believe about uh, what I have said up to this point, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that everything that I've said in the sermon up to this point is wrong. I would be willing to concede that. That does not change the fact that prayer changes things and that we are called to pray and that God is used to use prayer to accomplish his purposes. Listen to the words of John in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything, here's the phrase, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we ask of him. Now, we know that it was God's will to have mercy on the children of Israel. How do we know that it was God's will to have mercy on the children of Israel? Because he had mercy on the children of Israel. And if it had not been his will to show mercy to the children of Israel, then he would not have listened to the prayer of Moses. Use the Apostle Paul as an example. Paul, who was the greatest Christian that ever lived, had what is described as the thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was. I have no idea. He doesn't even describe it. A messenger from Satan that was sent to buffet him. And three times he goes before the Lord and he asks, Will you please remove it? And here's what the Lord says. No, no, and no. My grace is sufficient. If it had been God's will to remove that thorn in the flesh, then he would have done it. But he did not. Why did he not? Because it was not his will. Why did God relent from the evil that he said that he would do against the children of Israel? Because it was his will to do so. And how was his will accomplished? It was accomplished through prayer. You see, ultimately, at the end of the day, it was God's will to save, to spare, to show mercy upon his people. And it was also God's will to answer the prayer of Moses in order to do that. That being said, at the end of the day, God's ultimate purpose was accomplished and it was done through prayer. And this morning, that ought to really encourage you. That ought to put you at the end of your seat this morning saying, God actually wants me to pray. And as I pray, things are going to be different. Prayer changes things. And so looking at the prayer of Moses this morning, I want you to notice four attitudes, four attitudes of prayer that are in this request from Moses that we can learn from today. Here's number one. Pray with God himself as your focus and not yourself. Let me repeat that. Pray with God himself as your focus and not yourself. In this text, in the English Standard Version, there are 13 pronouns referring to God. In this prayer, he addresses God by his covenant name, Lord Jehovah. The content of the argument is talking to God primarily about God. And I want you to notice that Moses 
pays no attention whatsoever to his own personal opportunity for greatness. He has just heard from God that the nation indeed is going to live on, but that he himself is going to be the new George Washington. That he is going to be the new founder of the nation. And Moses has no interest in his own glory whatsoever. He doesn't even acknowledge the possibility. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times have you been to a prayer meeting? Or maybe even done this yourself. Where the prayers were barely being addressed to God at all the person begins to pray. And before you know it, they are telling stories. They are saying things to God. When in reality, what has happened is the person praying has forgotten about God altogether and they're just sort of talking to the other people in the room. Lord, you remember back in September... It was a rainy day, the day I lost my keys, and it was the day that uh, my wife had spilled that gallon of milk. And Lord, you remember. And it's like, wait a minute, God is not part of this prayer at all. The person is just basically bowing their head and closing their eyes and using this as an opportunity either to tell stories or to preach a sermon. I was even in a marital counseling situation once where the man... Uh, began to pray. I said, let's just close in a time of prayer. And for 10 minutes, the man chastised his wife in prayer. Lord, you know you've given me a mean wife. And Lord, you know that she... It's like, wait a minute. Prayer needs to be directed to God about God. He needs to be the focus. He needs to be the exclusive audience. The prayer of Moses is very theocentric. And I have to say, with respect to idolatry, when I was a young minister, and it still happens to me to this day, that oftentimes when I pray publicly, or have prayed publicly, I have been more worried about what I would be saying and what I would sound like and how articulate I would come across rather than to actually be approaching God. Let's try to throw in some big words. Let's make sure that our sentences all make sense. Let's pray theologically a correct prayer so that the other people in the room will be impressed. That's a form of idolatry. Prayer itself can actually be a form of idolatry. Well, Moses is not praying an idolatrous prayer here. He is praying a theocentric prayer, a prayer that is directed to God, about God. Practical application. Ladies and gentlemen, in 31 years of Christian ministry, I have never once yet done marital counseling with a couple who prays together. Never once. I'm not saying that the couple doesn't exist. Maybe there is a couple out there somewhere that does. First thing I ask a couple when we come together is, do you pray together? No. And they will think that to be something that is just sort of simple or, or rudimentary or fundamental that really just doesn't even... Yes, of course, we should pray, I understand. Well, do you pray together? No. Assignment number one, go home. Start to pray together. We come together again. They're still fighting. They're still arguing. They still have their issues. Have you started praying together? No. Sadly, the reason why I know this is not because I am that bright. It is from personal failed experience. I'm having a discussion with my wife, and I'm trying to impress upon her the fact that I am right and that she is wrong. Not in a harsh way, but just wanting to bestow my wisdom upon her. Anna, don't you see? Da, 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 da. And when she can't see it, well, then I've got to become a little bit more animated and say, are you kidding me? Look at you, da, 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 da. And here's what the truth, da, 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 da. And then she starts to come back. And then we are really getting into a spirited discussion. And she says, why don't we just pray? And I'm like, whew. I don't want to pray, okay? What I want to do is I want to explain to you why you're wrong and why I'm right. 
But what ends up happening, if it's a sincere, genuine prayer at that point, is that I no longer can make my argument because I am then exposed before God. God, you know my heart. Lord, you know the selfish motive behind what I said. Oh God, I never should have spoken to my wife that way. Oh God, please forgive me. And before you know it, the thing that we are arguing about becomes infinitesimal or even small, or it just evaporates and goes away. Why? Because we are addressing God. So, when you pray, pray to God. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? What did you learn today? Well, we learned that we're supposed to pray to God. If that's all you take home, you've had a good day. All right. Point number two. It's very closely related. And that is... Pray with an awareness of God's attributes and character. Now it's similar to point number one, but it's slightly different. Pray with an awareness of God's attributes and his character. Focus, uh, point number one was focusing on God or addressing God. Point number two is focusing on his character, being aware of who he is. You put them together, point number one is to whom you are speaking, and point number two, be aware of what he is like. And if you study this prayer, you'll notice in verse 11 that Moses acknowledges that God is a God of wrath. Why does your wrath burn hot against your people? In verse 12, you will notice that he speaks of God's burning anger. Moses also acknowledges and accentuates the omnipotence of God, the power of God. He speaks of God's power and mighty hand. He refers to God as a promise-keeping God who is to keep His promises made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel. He knows His God. And what do we read in Daniel 11.32? The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Perhaps one of the reasons why our prayers are not answered is because we are addressing a God, small g, that doesn't even exist. It's a God that we've created. It's a God that we have domesticated and trained. God is not who we imagine Him to be. He is who He is. And our tendency is to project something on Him which is a misrepresentation of His character. Why? Because we, as sinful people, think that He is like us. Psalm 50 verse 21 says, you thought that I was like yourself, but I will rebuke you and lay a charge before you. God responds when he is addressed accurately. And our failure to know him and to address him properly is directly proportionate to our failure to study the word. You see, in the Bible, the word of God, God has revealed himself in the scripture so that we might know him. And Moses prays effectually and fervently because he knows God. So I want to give you three practical points of application, three recommendations under this second point. Number one, read the Bible. Read the Bible. And when you read the Bible, give careful attention to who God is and incorporate that into your prayers, either as you praise Him or as you construct your arguments and make your requests known to Him. And there is nothing wrong whatsoever with making an argument before God as to why He should answer your prayer. That is what Moses does here. But just do it in light of who God is. And this is not a form of manipulation. Manipulation is when you go to someone and you butter them up and then you make the request. I know that in the past you have been so generous, you've been so benevolent, there have been many who have been helped by you in the past, and the good that you've done over the years, it just, I couldn't even begin to say how much good you've done over the years, and, 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 and really, you know, uh, you are very well revered, so forth and so on, and oh, by the way, would you be willing to make a donation? Well, the person at that point has been puffed up with such pride and they're going to, at this point, be manipulated into giving and that's what you would be doing. That's not what we're doing when we bring the attributes of God before God. <clears throat> Every year on the day before opening day, our family gathers and we watch the movie Field of Dreams. You, has anyone ever seen this film with James Earl Jones and Kevin Costner? It is a baseball movie. 
And uh, so we watch it, and then we cry, and then the next day, uh, the Mets win, and then the Mets lose for the rest of the season. But, but it, it's, it's a great tradition that we have. Now, in the movie, Kevin Costner um, hears the voice, and he has to go and kidnap James Earl Jones, who is a retired liberal author who's living by himself in Boston, and Kevin Costner um, is having trouble persuading James Earl Jones to go with him to a baseball game, so he sneaks into his apartment, he pretends that he has a gun, and James Earl Jones takes a crowbar, and he begins to chase Kevin Costner around the apartment, and as he is about to hit him, Kevin Costner, knowing something about James Earl Jones' character, uh, that he is a, uh, um, uh, a liberal and he has read his, he has read his uh, materials in the past, as he is about to get hit, Kevin Costner says, You're a pacifist! And he has to put the crowbar down. Why? Because something has been told to him which is true about himself. Ah! I'm a pacifist. I can't hit you. We well, see the illustration breaks down. Thank you. Illustration breaks down because God is not moved in that way. But the truth of it is this. God never tires of hearing truths about himself sincerely acknowledged in prayer. He is primarily interested in his own glory. And so as you read the Bible, learn about God, and then incorporate things about God into your prayers, God loves to hear that. Here are my second and third recommendations under this second point. Number one, get a hold of the, cop get a hold of the copy of the book Knowing God by J.I. Packer and read it. Wear it out. And my third recommendation is get a hold of the little book by A.W. Pink, the attributes of God and wear it out as well. Knowing the character and the attributes of God is an effective tool in prayer. This brings us to point number three, and that is pray with a passion for God's glory and reputation. Pray with a passion for God's glory and reputation. The prayer that God answers is the prayer that is going to make him look good. So now you look at the prayer of Moses and how does he pray? Lord, my passion is for your glory. And Lord, if you wipe them out, the Egyptians, the Egyptians who hate you, will make up lies about you. And they will say that it was your intent all along to isolate your people in the mountains and then to commit genocide. They will accuse you falsely. They will accuse you of something that you never intended. And Lord, if you kill them all, it is going to make you look bad. And Lord, I don't want the Egyptians to make up lies about you. I want you to receive glory and not slander. I want your glory. And so I ask the question, do we pray with the glory of God as our highest priority? Turn to the New Testament book of Luke. It's one of my favorite parables. And I think it's one of the most misunderstood parables. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. And remember the point that we are to be praying with the glory and the reputation of God in mind. Luke chapter 5, it's in the context of prayer, and Jesus said, and then he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Now, from within here doesn't mean inside the house. That would be redundant. Of course he is within inside the house. It means he will answer from within inside his own mind. He will just be thinking this answer, not speaking the answer. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. Uh, the door is sh now shut. My children are with me in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impotence, and that's the uh, ESV word, 
Um, New King James probably would have persistence. That is a very bad mistranslation, but I'll get to that in a, in, in a moment. He will rise and give him whatever he asks. All right. What's going on in this particular parable? There are some cultural factors that I have to explain to put this parable into proper perspective. First of all, you need to understand that they did not have refrigeration. And they did not have large cupboards where they kept a lot of food. Usually, what you ate in the ancient Near East was what you cooked that day or what you baked that day. So there, were, there was nothing usually in a household that was left over that was edible. There were no mini marts, there were no bodegas, there was no Taco Bell. There was nothing usually accessible that was close by. Here's the second thing you need to understand culturally. There were no telephones, there was no email. And so you couldn't tell when your guest was going to arrive or even if your guest was coming. You couldn't gauge how far you were going to have to go and when you were going to arrive where you were. And in this particular case, the person has arrived at midnight. If he shows up at midnight, he is tired and he is hungry. And the Jewish people, who were very hospitable, could not have a guest coming to them who was tired, who was hungry, that they did not give something to eat. But you didn't know when your guest was going to arrive. If you would have known, you could have prepared. But there's no preparation that possibly could be made. Here's the third cultural factor. The people did not have glass windows or insulated houses. Everything that happened outside usually was heard inside. Every year my wife and I go to Jamaica and we have a, a, a great time there doing mission work on the island of Jamaica. But the bedroom that we sleep in, we leave the windows open and we can hear everything that is going on out in the neighborhood or in the courtyard around us. But there's one difference. There's a lot of reggae music, there are a lot of trucks going by, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of sound out there that is manufactured or amplified sound. At this time, there are no trucks, there is no reggae music, there were no people who were awake and about and outside, there were no electric lights. People, generally speaking, went to bed and went to sleep shortly after sundown. So anything that happened in the street or in your yard or in the house next to you outside, you would be able to hear it at night. The fourth cultural factor that I want to point out here is that when people went to bed, they snuggled it up pretty tight for the night. The mats were rolled out. The family had taken up all of the floor space. There was no electric lights. And so in order to get up out of your bed and answer the door and get food for someone, you had to walk over your family. You had to walk over your family in the dark to get a light, to get the door unlocked. It was a major ordeal just to get up out of bed and to give somebody something. With that in mind, Here's what happens. It's midnight. You are in rapid eye movement. Your guest arrives and you want to give your guest something to eat, but you don't have anything. But you know someone who probably will have something and so you go to their house and everybody in the neighborhood hears you. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up! What? A friend of mine has arrived. Could you loan me three loaves of bread? I promise I will pay you back. He just needs something to eat. Inside. Silence. During the silence, there is a conversation. Ugh. I'm in for the night. Go away. I don't want you to bother me. And Jesus says, not because he is the man's friend, but because of his, and the word that you might have in the New King James is perseverance. Don't take my word for it. Go to a lexicon, go to a Greek lexicon, look it up. The best word that should be put in there is the word shame. Because of his shame, he gets up and does not lend him three loaves, but gives him, doesn't loan, but gives him as many as he needs. In other words, here's what's going on. I don't want to get up, but if I don't get up, everybody in the neighborhood 
is going to know I'm not a good friend, I am stingy, I am selfish, and I am not benevolent. And so, as not to be shamed, I'm going to get up, I'm going to crawl over my family, I'm going to find the light, I'm going to give this guy as many loaves as he needs, and I'm going to say, no problem, have a good night, and I'm going to get back in bed. Why? Because I'm motivated by shame. He doesn't do it because of friendship, he does it because of shame. In other words, he doesn't want to look bad in the neighborhood. And the parable is given in the context of prayer. The very next phrase says, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Several years ago, I was attempting to evangelize a gentleman and his two sons. And so I took my two sons with me to a restaurant. And we in our family have always had a rule. We don't go to a restaurant very often, but we've always had a rule when we go to a restaurant, and that is when the waiter comes and asks, would you like something to drink? The answer is yes. I would like water, tap water. We're not going to pay for drinks at a restaurant, okay? Just get tap water, you'll be fine with that. So the waiter comes and asks the sons of the man that I'm with, would you like something to drink? And they both said, yes, we'll have a Coke. To which my sons knew they had me right where they wanted me. And they said, yes, we'll have a Coke too. Because they knew at that point I could not <laughs> say, wait a minute, you have water while they're having Coke. Why? Because it would have made me look like the cheap, stingy person that I am. <laughs> Now the illustration breaks down because God is not sleeping and God is not preoccupied and that is not the point. That's not the point of the parable. That's not the point of Moses' prayer. The point of the parable and the point of the prayer is this. God is radically committed to his own glory. That which makes him look good. And so when we pray, our prayers need to be, Lord, do this for your own glory. Lord, send a revival to our church, not so that we will be popular, but send a revival to our church so that your name might be magnified. Lord, answer my prayer, please, and sanctify this person who, Lord, professes to know you. But, Lord, they are shaming you in the community, living the life of compromise that they are living. Lord, would you, for your glory, this one is claiming to be yours. Would you do a work of sanctification in them? Or whatever your prayer is, Lord, not to us, not to us, but, Lord, you receive the glory for this. I think part of the reason why our prayers go unanswered is because we have little interest in bringing glory to God. James chapter 4 says you have not because you ask not. But the next verse, James 4, 3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so my friends, God is not a genie in a bottle that you rub and he comes out and you make your three wishes. It, it, he doesn't want you to pray so that you will be comfortable or you will be rich or you will be healthy. He wants you to pray and he wants to answer those prayers so that his glory will be amplified in all the earth. God is primarily concerned with his own glory. So pray with a view toward the glory of God. And finally, point number four. Pray with the gospel in mind. Moses prays, Lord, I want to remind you of an oath that you swore. You promised Abraham, you promised Isaac, and you promised Jacob that you would multiply their descendants like the stars and that you would give them this land. Moses understands grace. Listen, I've been talking for a long time, but I, I really need you to understand this aspect of prayer. You either pray with a view toward works or a view toward grace. If he had prayed with a view toward works, he would have prayed, Lord, you just don't know these people. They're really not as bad as you think. Now, Moses knew that they were a stiff-necked people and that they were idolatrous. He doesn't claim the merits of those people at all. 
He doesn't pray, Lord, give us one more chance. I swear, if you just give us one more chance. How many times have you prayed that? How many times have you prayed, Lord, if you give me another chance, I swear I will never do that again. That is not praying a prayer of grace. That is praying a prayer of works. Lord, it, these people, I mean, they were slaves living in an idolatrous land. They have never known anything about your ways. I mean, can you not cut them a little bit of slack? They're really not that bad. He doesn't pray that at all. He takes the prayer to God, about God, for the glory of God, accentuating the attributes of God. And he says, God, I want you to remember an oath that you swore to yourself because you can swear to no one greater. And you promised, Lord, you promised the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Israel or Jacob that you would multiply the seed and that you would bring them into the promised land. And it is not just about national Israel. That was a part of it. But what was the end of it? Well, when God comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless those that bless you and I'm going to curse those that curse you. And through you, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. It didn't just have to do with growing a big nation and then coming in and possessing the land. It came as the seed of the woman is carried on through the tribe of Judah. And there is one from the tribe of Judah who is born and he is the Christ. He is God over all. God blesses the nations. All the nations of the earth are blessed through Jesus Christ. Now follow the argument. Our prayers are answered. Why? Because at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, there is one who is seated, who is interceding for us, who is talking on our behalf, who is saying to God, Father, listen to what this one is saying. I have paid for all of their sins. I have given that person my righteousness. And Lord, now what they are bringing before you is in accordance with your will. And so, Father, will you hear that prayer? Well, in order for Jesus to be seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, what had to happen? He had to ascend. And in order for him to ascend, what happened? He had to raise from the dead. In order to raise from the dead, he had to do what? He had to die on the cross for our sins. And he did. And in order to die for our sins, what had to happen? He had to be born. And in order to be born, he had to be born into what? A family. And that family had to come from someone. And where did that family come from? It came from the tribe of Judah, the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And so, Lord, I want you to remember, you made a promise. And you swore by yourself. And Moses doesn't have the full orbed gospel that I am preaching right now. He doesn't have all that information. But guess who does have the information? The one who can do something about it? God himself. God knows the gospel. God hears the gospel. God responds to the gospel. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he said he would do to his people. And so we pray with the gospel in mind. Lord, I have nothing to bring you. I am nothing but a wretch. Lord, I, why should you even be listening to me right now? Lord, I am not worthy to be in your presence. But God, you made a promise. Lord, you made an eternal covenant of grace with your son. Lord, he died for me. And Lord, he lives for me. And Lord, now, please, oh God, Oh, God, would you do something for your glory? Lord, I desire that my daughter-in-law would have a healthy baby. Lord, I desire that whatever complication is there, God, that you would remove it. Lord, will you hear my prayer? I don't have a plea before you. I, I don't have a leg to stand on. I don't have anything to offer you. But Lord, there is one seated at your right hand who is interceding for me. And so, Lord, would you hear my prayer? And for your glory, Lord, would you turn whatever around needs to get turned around? Lord, might there be a child born? And Lord, might that child live for you? And God, might that child bring you glory? Oh, God, hear my prayer. Amen. And what else do we need to pray about? We need to pray about everything. 
we need to pray about our marriages. We need to pray about sickness. We need to pray about sanctification. We need to pray for revival. We need to pray. You know, I, I, I've given this message, and the one thing that I have not talked about is prayer. This message assumes that you will pray. This is how to pray, but when you preach a message on how to pray, you assume that people will pray and that they do pray. And so I would say to you today in closing that if you know how to pray and yet you don't pray, we have wasted our time here together. I pray this has not been a waste of time. I pray that Grace Baptist Church will pray. And as you do, pray to God. Pray remembering who God is. Pray for His glory and His renown. Pray with the gospel in view. You have one plea before Him, and it is Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, thank You for the attentiveness of these people. And now, Lord, may application be brought uh, to their heart. Lord, may they, uh, Lord, not only have learned today, but Lord, may they learn this day, Lord, and apply. Lord, may I apply. May my family apply. May we, Lord, pray according to your will for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.